my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much for this very interesting, to me it's very, basically a very interesting topic. So, so it's a, like a joint work done by SIFA, myself, Dr. Simon Wall and CU. So it's a collaborative work that we try to look into the impact of this cash transfer on child labor and education theory and evidence. So let me uh, uh, give the outline of today's presentation. So I'll briefly discuss the background and motivation of this study, then the modeling framework of this study, then the, the program and design and empirical strategy, then the result and discussion. And the, at the end, I will give some policy implication that emerge from this discussion. So I'll start with the, the question of the why child labor and the enrollment is so important for us. So if we look into the, the, the country dynamics and the regional heterogeneity and also the prevalence of very high child labor, so then it will induce us to look into the factors what, what causes these high prevalences of child labor, especially if we look into the South Punjab, interior scene, KPK, even in Balochistan. So you can find a very high child labor. And what are the, the rationale behind these child labor? So, so the theory basically gives us some sort of answer to these, and this, uh, this very relevant question, why child labor and the low enrollment, in, especially among the uh, poor families. So the main argument that emerges, like the family basically substitutes schooling with the child work uh, to, to break the vicious circle of poverty where they are facing a lot of uh, financial issues. So keeping this in view, so the, the main uh, rationale behind this to send their kids to the labor market and to earn some sort of uh, uh, livelihood to spend on their uh, living standard. Now the, the next question that, that basically for us is to how we can break this circle. One is families basically are poor and if they are poor, the human capital is low. And if the human capital is low, there is no schooling. Then ultimately, the next choice is to send people to, to the, uh, the labor market. And if they are in the labor market, then it perpetuate into the, the, the overall standard where they are. So the answer lies with the so many factors that, that can act as a, like a binding constraint as well as a push factor to to, to break this vicious circle of poverty. So starting from if we can look into the, the literature, it said that the, it's like the main is the role of government that can create some sort of window for these people to push them from the labor market to the school. And also some sort of human capital activities that give a strength to, to the, the parents that they can earn some sort of living standard. With this context, the, over the last two or three decades, there is a, like a huge focus on this social protection, that the social protection is a strategy to basically alleviate poverty as well as the human capital development. With this background, as you people know that the Pakistan has initiated a very large social protection system in 2007 eight with the name of BISP. So the aim was this to, to give some sort of support to ultra poor to, to, to smooth their consumptions and also in the long term to develop some sort of human capital and, and the livelihood strategy. With these two, two key motivation, like one is the prevalence of very high child labor with the low enrollment rate and the massive intervention by the government to to uplift the status of these poor, poor people. We are aiming to see how this cash transfer basically facilitate in term of uh, uh, child labor among the ultra poor. And if we are looking at the child labor, then the parallel to that, if the, uh, the, the parents basically take off their children from the child market, uh, definitely the next market for them is the, the education market. So whether they are sending their kid to, to the, uh, school or not, that would be a subsequent question for us to look into these things. So with these two, two aims in our minds, we examine the impact of unconditional cash transfer program on child labor and school outcome 
among the ultra poor targeted by the BISP. So the next important thing that how we can model these, uh, all those things and conceptualize basically the linkages between the, the cash transfer program as well as the, the child labor and also so the school enrollment. A standard literature basically gives us some sort of answer that the child labor is a risk coping mechanism for many poor households that are exposed to a various shocks, including weather, health, income shocks. In the absence of other coping mechanism, such as taking loans, requesting assistance from formal or informal networks, income shocks compel these parents to take their children out of school and engage them in the, the labor market. So basically the literature, well-established literature, that's as long as parents are unable to meet their basic subsistence needs, the child labor will perpetuate. So this is like not a, like a, a first choice by the parents, but it's a, like a forced phenomena. And if they are failed to meet their, their daily needs, that what we call a subsistence need, then the ultimately the choice is basically to send their kids to the labor market. If we look into the luxury axiom, that is like the choices between the and the, the labor work and whether, whether the, the luxury choices that your child labor is not a preference, but it is induced by the income constraint, basically. So income uh, deficiency and income constraint will push them, these people to, to, to be engaged in the, the labor market. So these parents basically what we call the poverty stricken household send their children to work or engage them in the labor because the total household income from the adult wages is very low. The expectation is that the child labor should decline and by extension, school attendance would increase with increase in the income. So these are the underlying assumptions. If we so give them some sort of income support that will ultimately translate it into the low child labor and the higher schooling rates. With these, uh, like the uh, background factor and the, the theoretical argument, we assume that this cash transfer basically facilitate in terms of uh, making a transition from the labor market to the schooling. So the, the choice from the transition from one market to another market basically is mediated by these, these cash transfer schemes. So these are the underlying assumptions that we use to, to develop our theoretical model. So we use a very simple theoretical model where we assume that the, uh, the, how the government transfer financed by, by the labor income taxation affect family decision regarding child labor and human capital development through child schooling and per, parental expenditure for the education. So these are the underlying assumptions that uh, so we use to, to develop these models. The key implication of this model that we use for this analysis is that the effectiveness of cash transfer depends on uh, four things. One is the relative uh, income of the families that receive the transfer, weighting parameters that determine the importance of total time spent in school, weighting parameters that determine the importance of education expenditure in the labor productivity of child and last degree of parental altruism, because how they gauge or how they prefer different market option, whether they use the, the labor market option or the school market option uh, for their kids depend upon these things. To mathematically drive this whole notion into a estimate table model, we use this overlapping generation model of two period where there is like one is agent and the other is a child and the adulthood. These are the two agents, those lives in two period of time and each generation consists of continuum of agents with unit mass. In second period, each agent gives birth to another so that the population remain constant over time. And each family make decision regarding work, consumption, expenditure for children education and children's schooling time. So they, basically the schooling time is that the choice between the layer and the, the school work. So, uh, uh, so we use a very simple uh, consumption uh, utility function that the utility basically comes from uh, two products. One is the, the, the total consumption and the second is the human capital of the child that is HD plus one. So 
a parent supply one unit of time for labor and the child supply is one minus h unit of time for labor where h is basically a, like a zero to one in the unit of schooling so each parent receive a government transfer that earlier i said the like uh, financed by the, the, the tax so t and earn tax labor income one minus t h where h is in other human capital and tau is the fixed amount of income tax rate these are the underlying assumption that we use to to build our model so these are all the technical things that we use in this whole set of notions so we use this human capital function that the uh, the next year human capital depends on h e and t basically these are the three different parameters that the existing human capital expenditure and the, and the, the the parents human capital these establish the the, the, the accumulation of the the next year in human capital so the government runs a balanced budget that's a simple assumption where you these are the the, the military. with this so what are the learning from this model that we try to see so there are four main things that emerge from uh, this uh, whole set of theoretical model first if the family who receive a government transfer has parental human capital h and is below average of the parental human capital that is a h bar that's shown over the screen then in the economy then the government transfer financed by the labor income taxation increase the family's consumption expenditure for the child education and child schooling time ht the so government transfer basically reduce one minus h that is the the labor time so so if the the, the difference between h and the prevailing uh, the human capital as and the h bar that the average human capital then the the these transfer basically induce parents to 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 increase uh, the expenditure on education as well as to reduce the time spent to the labor market so it will ultimately increase the time spent to uh, to to the education market so these are the trade out between either to spend time in one market to another market it is the next question is ultimately how the the basically the human capital is uh, uh, a parents expenditure are influenced and there are three to four factor that influence the choices of the parents in term of their expenditure on the education so the the, the entire model is given in the paper so so uh, i'll not spend my time on these technical things so i move to the the context of this whole exercise so as most of us basically knows that the the cash transfer program run by the government under the name of bain their income support plan is one of the and the largest uh, cash transfer program operated in the south asian country so and, and over 5 million people are targeted under this program and the, the payment mode is electronic so uh, like uh, the payment is uh, dispersed through either to uh, atm cards or through biometric verification and then the most important thing in this whole exercise is uh, how these people were targeted and who is the beneficiary of this program so uh, this basically started uh, targeting with the community based targeting where they disperse a farm with the help of mns and mps and they were the basically people who identify the ultra poor then with the accumulation of some knowledge in 2010 11 this transform from a community based more uh, like a sophisticated or scientific method that we call proxy mean testing based targeting approach and recently it is one of the like uh, acceptable phenomena when those they use and then the the, the targeting uh, uh, the beneficiary basically is the ever ever married woman so it's a more like uh, uh, some sort of uh, as you say the the female centered program and the, that's why we feel that it is important to see how these uh, this program influence the the labor market as well as the the education market choices within the household because the female basically is catering the uh, is the main decision maker in term of sending kids to to school or to to the labor market so it uh, influenced secondly we feel this uh, program is highly have a importance whether the, the gender gap that we, we notice and we know that there is a big gender gap in term of education enrollment as well as the higher education among the girls and the boys in in our country how this uh, the 
the women centered program basically facilitate to narrow down this gender gap in term of uh, education or enrollment so with these all type of assumption we feel that it is important to see how this program operated in the country and how it make it uh, influence the preferences of the, the household in terms of making their choices between the, the labor market and the education market so we so have yes there's a question if you would you like to take the question now yes um, before we move on to so Kate is asking that the model looks like it's set up so that children are either in school or they're working. Uh, does this actually match with the uh, data that you have? Do you see any children who are doing neither schooling nor working in the labor market? Yes, uh, the basically assumption that I earlier said is the basically a trade off between the two different markets. One is the child, the uh, the labor market and the school market and the, the the time spent in two different markets depends on the, the trade-off and the preferences of the household. So the, when we see the data, we, there are a number of questions where in a number of people, kids, those are not, either not in the labor market, nor in the, in the schooling market. So there are evidence in the data that shows there are like a decent uh, number of kids, those are not involved in any market. So it also gave us some idea how we can make sure that they, either this transition will occur. And I'll explain these things in, when I'll uh, show the construction of these variables, how different variables were constructed uh, and uh, we measure this, uh, the, the, uh, the educational outcome of the children. So we have a, like a three rounds of data set. One is the baseline and that was conducted in 2011 and it covers eight, 1,675 households, both uh, where we have a treatment as well as the control group. So the one is those, those are targeted by the BASP and other is, is those are as a control group. So how they define this treatment and control group that I'll explain when I'll uh, give a description of the, and the, the empirical strategy as well as the other uh, data validation test. So I'll spend some time on it by defining how these all things use. So we start with this administrative data on PMT, that basically a welfare score on which in, in, the, the data collected by the OPM and try to, to construct a treatment as well as the control group. Then it was a first round conducted in 2013. It covers 8,221 households and few were missed due to lack of uh, house, uh, household information and some other uh, missing information. So they excluded those missing information also. And the panel basically consists of 8,221. In between 2013 and 2016, they also connected and the other one that is uh, like uh, in 2014, but it was very close to 2013. So we didn't include that wave in our analysis. So we only used the, the last round that was conducted in 2016. Though there is another wave that was conducted in 29, but it was uh, like uh, conducted uh, when we completed this analysis. So, and, and the first basically, uh, the best contract with OPM was to, to conduct baseline first round 2013, 14 and 16. So we used that these three lines. So in 2016, they resampled and reassessed the, the sampling methodology and try to expand the, the sample size. And in 2016, 11,665 households were covered. Based on that data set, like baseline, first round, and the final round, uh, we construct uh, two panel. One is uh, the panel between 2011 and 13 that we assume gave us the short run impact of BISP on the outcome indicator that we are using labor market as well as the education market. Then we construct another panel like 2016, uh, 11 and 16, and we assume this will give us uh, the, the medium to long term impact of cash transfer program on, on the outcome indicator. So uh, in, two th in short run, we have a panel of 8,221, but in long run, 
and uh, due to mismatch of pmt score and uh, they drop uh, so many household and the panel basically consists of 3415 this give us some sort of idea how this iteration will affect the the overall efficacy of our result and how we can uh, control this impact of uh, iteration in term of our analysis so earlier the a study done by ambler on the impact of this cash transfer on the labor supply they also use the same data set and she said that though iteration is very high but there is no significant deviation in term of the outcome uh, alternately they also proposes to do a cross section analysis to see the to establish the robustness of result uh, similarly we also use the, the cross sectional data set like the we re examine the entire impact of BASP on outcome variable for cross section data set like for 2013 we assume and also for 2016 so these are the robustness check that we we ultimately use in the later stage to to see whether we will be able to see in the our result are robust and, and not subject to to the the panel and the, and the household that are that were interviewed so these are the data set that we use for our analysis purpose so, so the next thing yes uh, another question on this data and particularly attrition um so again kate is asking uh, how does attrition compare between treatment and control and if it differs how might that affect your results um and then there was also a comment by Dr. Moazam about uh, the model where he's saying that uh, should the kids time be a function of their schooling time, their labor time, as well as layer. So is layer included in the assumptions that you laid out for the model? Okay, they're related to the question of Kate on the iteration because this is a very critical issue even for us and we try to see how we can overcome this uh, the iteration problem and looking into the different dimensions. So initially we look into the paper published by the uh, Ambler as I earlier said, she used a similar uh, like the, these three ways she used in the initial paper, she only used uh, data of 2011 and 13 and in the second paper on the, uh, the labor supply where she tried to see the impact of uh, BISP on the adults labor even in the the child labor also so she also use this data set of course the the iteration is like a, a big issue the real problem was uh, not it was not the iteration not meant by the the program itself but when the opm started is survey in 2010 11 at that time the basically the the new census was in process so this actually didn't completed the, the the whole process of this targeting. So then they define their own PMT score using the, the, the indicator defined by the BISP and collected the baseline. But then when they completed the, the, the baseline and they revisit the field in 2013, at that, that time BIS uh, the, completed the, the targeting uh, survey and uh, fully utilize the the census data to to target beneficiary then they match the the, the pmt score calculated by the opm in term of their impact assessment and the pmt used by the base there were some divergence between the the pmt those calculated by the the opm as well as uh, the the base so eventually, as a, as a the policy decision basically was targeting more than five million beneficiaries, then they proposed and use this the PMT score calculated by the BISP. So in this way, there was some sort of like a drop of a household. So it was not a systematic drop to me, but uh, we are also looking for some sort of suggestion for other people if they can give us some idea how we can mathematically show that this is not a systematic phenomena so it will not affect the outcome of our analysis so so we are still working it's a, like a first draft of paper and we are trying to see whether we can include some sort of test but the the ambler basically establishes that uh, there is no big difference and it might not affect the overall outcome of the result so 
And later to the other comments like uh, like the suggestion that the, the, the choices between the the assumption that we use basically we as earlier I said we assume that the the the, the total time basically is allocated for two type of activities with, with the very simplest version of our model. One is in the, to engage in the labor market or to engage in the uh, so. So maybe if we can relax this assumption, we can make it more sophisticated. So with this, now I come, yes. Any subsequent? Uh, so, yes, there are some follow-up uh, suggestions uh, that you may want to consider about this issue. So one, Kate is saying that perhaps you may want to show a table with attrition on the left-hand side and the above poverty means testing cutoff on the right-hand side. And also that for your purposes, it might be more, more relevant to actually show um, the differences between those who are above and below the cutoff as calculated in NSER and not OPM. And if so, if there are these differences, then by how much do these differences exist? So perhaps talking about those numbers um, in the future, perhaps in your paper, that might be helpful. I think it's a very interesting uh, suggestion. So I really look into these because it will be, help us to to basically justify the the attrition. We have the data on, like uh, uh, from the the BISP point of view, and also the, from the OPM point of view. So we can use all these things. So so even uh, I'll discuss with the cat because I have the census data also. Maybe not for the whole uh, all district, but for the. 10 to 14 district, maybe we can use that data set also to see whether we can address this comment in a much better way or not. So we use like uh, educational uh, uh, measurement, we use three different measurement. And one is we consider the child age between five to 14 and uh, we subsequently divide into two groups. One is like, uh, uh, the age group 5 in, into 11 and the 12 into 14. So the enrollment rate, dropouts, and grade promotion was the three indicators that we use to measure the, the, the impact of BISP on educational outcome. The next we use the, this child labor. So as earlier said, the child labor is basically a very uh, like a tricky thing that how we can uh, measure this child labor. So. So the first, whether the child participated in the, the labor market in the last, in the week previous to survey. So here we define uh, the labor market as work by the children between age five to 14. In this way, we combine three categories. One is child labor outside the household. We measure whether or not child have paid or unpaid employment outside household and how many hours they reported working each year. Second, we use the time spent by the children helping with the course and the household and the last child labor within the household enterprises. So either on or the off the farm. So these three different indicator, one, the child either spent time outside the household for the, the monetary as well as the non-monetary earning and the second, either to support household activities within the household and third, the, to work on the, the household enterprises. So these are the three different categories that we use to, to define the, the child labor participation. And within that, uh, so we use whether the, how many hours children basically worked in the uh, past one week. Uh, with this, so uh, as you know, the, over the last uh, few years, there is a multi-dimensional concept of everything. So poverty is a multi-dimensional concept. So keeping this in, we, we assume that the, the child poverty itself a multi dimensional concept and recently uh, one of the report uh, i didn't remember the, the basically the 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 agency who conducted this report but it's based on the mix conducted for punjab government they they uh, they define this child poverty and multi dimensional child poverty by including uh, the child specific dimension within that uh, that multi dimensional poverty so keeping in that in mind we assume it is better to have a, an additional uh, measure to, to see how this BISP basically influence the overall, maybe BISP failed to, to have an impact on one specific indicator, but it might have some impact on an overall, uh, the dynamics of this, uh, the child poverty. For that, we 
try to construct uh, the multi-dimensional child poverty index and it captures the extent of deprivation in education and the child condition and child condition is basically measured by the, the participation in the labor market. So we have the four different indicator to measure the education dimension and the two indicator for the uh, for the labor market dimension and within that so the all are given on the table so you can see that how we define different cutoff and eventually we equally weighted uh, each dimension uh, like education and uh, the labor market dimension and equal weight within the construction of this multi-dimensional index and within each di dimension each indicator have the equal weight just like uh, given on the, the table that within each indicator within each dimension each indicator have like equal weight so uh, this is the, the like the standard practice uh, used in the, the literature like i myself did a couple of studies where i have constructed a multi-dimensional uh, index for education as well as for the health similarly the the, the multi-dimensional uh, poverty index proposed by the alkair and foster also use the similar approach so they give the equal weight to, to a, the dimension as well as the equal weight within a, to indicator within each dimension so so we follow the same uh, standard practice so so in this way we try to see how the dynamics will box within the the system either it influenced the individual indicator of the uh, defined on the previous slide or it have some sort of a composite impact on the overall a multi-dimensional child poverty so, so with these we, these are the things that we find so the identification strategy and the, the empirical way how to, to to measure these impacts so we use very standard uh, approach that is what we call uh, regression discontinuity design and the, the construction of this uh, pmt variable will allow us to, to apply to the RDD rather than the shop RDD in a polynomial regression framework. So we apply this RDD. And earlier literature done by myself as well as the, the, the Amblers and the others also use the similar approach to, to measure the outcome, of, uh, uh, measure the impact of this cash transfer on any type of outcome indicator as we are using in this case. The, the child market either it's the labor market or either it's the education market so then when we are using this uh, the rdd then the, the most important thing within this framework is the the bandwidth that we use to define our controlment uh, control group as well as the treatment group so so the opm basically use um, and the five bandwidth below and above the cutoff line the cutoff was 16.17 to, to identify these control group and treatment group. So, so we use this in this practice, but later on for the, the robustness, so we also use the other possible uh, bandwidth option, like we reduce bandwidth to three, as well as to use an optimal bandwidth selection criteria to, to see what would be the, the, the optimal bandwidth. So to, to ensure that what we are trying to say is like based on the robustness or so. This was the empirical strategy that we use. So the, the important thing in terms of this uh, RDD analysis is uh, the, the, this RDD based on some sort of assumption if, until unless those assumption uh, meets the, the, the general criteria, you won't be able to, to apply this, uh, uh, this uh, RDD. So, and so the, this first, like we use the, the identification strategy, as I earlier said, it based on the PMT score. So it would be very difficult to, to influence the PMT score that based on 23 different indicator by the individuals. Then the, the clear existence of this uh, discontinuity among the among the way, uh, the treatment as well as the control group. So the, the figure shows on the one side of this the slide give you the clear idea that there is a big gap between that control and the treatment group then the the last this the manipulation of this enforcing variable or the running variable that's the pmt either it is manipulated by the uh, the individual or not so for that we also use two different approaches one is we use the histogram to see the distribution of these families across the household was very fair so it will give us idea that there is no manipulation then there is a standard 
a test proposed by the Kelly Nico so at all 2018 so we also use that and the result is reported in term of the graph on the figure that there is uh, no evidence of manipulation and the last we also see whether there is an impact of uh, like uh, based on the predetermined characteristics of the household and if they are significant it means then and it, it would it won't the result may not be the robust so we see that there is no significant impact of uh, based on the uh, the predetermined uh, characteristics of the household that we also use as a covariate in, in term of our analysis. So all these things uh, compel us that the, we, we are on the right track and we can use these things. So now I move to the, the first uh, result of this whole exercise. So, so the main uh, the, the slide will give you the idea that the, there is a significant impact on uh, enrollment as well as the great promotion but it failed to induce any it has no impact on dropout so so and the and the other important finding is that we see with, with these that that in short term it have a lot like a, for example on enrollment it has a like a very high impact as shown by the the coffee and point six eight but with the passage of time as earlier said it, over the medium to long run the 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 magnitude or the the, the the the, uh, the the value of the coefficient goes down it shows that there is a vein a vein of in term of the the result so in the in, in like earlier in the initial stage of the program it has a strong impact on enrollment but the, with the passage of time there will be an adjustment and the, the, the impact goes down so these are the and there is no impact on the the drop off so then we see how this is gender-wise impact uh, and we find that this cash transfer has significant positive impact on enrollment across both genders, specifically the estimated coefficient that uh, two years after the BISC cash transfer, boys in the treatment group around 79% uh, are even more likely to enroll in school while girls in the treatment group are 64%. It's so consistent with the previous uh, slide that I have shown that the effect of cash transfer uh, way enough over the time. So as you see in the the uh, the medium to long the panel the, the coefficient are very small as compared to the previous one for dropout rates we find that this intervention substantially reduced the dropout among boys in the short term but increased dropout among the girl this is like a very interesting so mm -hmm. so specifically boys in the treatment group are 49 percent a point less likely to drop out of school while the girl are more likely to drop out of school this finding in line with the th th theoretical prediction which suggests that the differences in parental preferences and altruism toward boys and girls can influence the, the dynamics around child labor and the human capital development and the preferences and the greater altruism towards male children in Pakistan are culturally embedded and well documented in the literature. So in case of grade promotion, we find that the BISP intervention significantly induced grade promotion among boys, but not among the girls. This finding can also be linked with the cultural environment that the in gender greater altruism toward the male than female and thus female tend to engage in the other household activities leaving less time for school activities so consequently influencing the grade promotion. Then we like further see the, the, the impact of uh, age wise so so as shown in the slide, so I'll skip these things and move to, so then we again see the, the this gives you the idea that how, if we cross tab between the, the different age group as well as, as the gender, then how this impact will vary. And the, the basically this figure shows that the BISC cash transfer has a positive and significant impact on enrollment across different age group of the boys. It, in contrast, the this cash transfer has a positive and significant impact on rural monger at primary school level, but not at the middle school level. In case of dropout, this cash transfer has a negative and significant impact on dropout among boys, both at primary as well as the middle school. On the other hand, cash transfer helped to curtail the dropout among girls at the primary school level, but increasing dropout at the middle school. That's the general trend. So it failed to basically retain the female at the higher level of education. Um, this, yes. 
so much. These results were very interesting. There are a few comments uh, from the audience. So, uh, Kate, thank you so much for being so active and interactive. Uh, she's asking uh, that, uh, can you please explain the intuition underlying the table, the previous tables? For instance, it seems odd that both the enrollment as well as uh, dropout is increasing at the same time. So enrollment is increasing by 63 percentage points while dropout is increasing by 57 percentage points. So how should we be reading the magnitudes in this table? And um, it's also hard to understand why the results are so different between different versions of the panel. So can you sort of comment on that? So as earlier I said, the, the, what we are feeling that in the, the, the first panel basically give us the idea at the, the short run, very quick, uh, uh, like uh, after three years, what would be the impact of BISP and it might be uh, the reason that uh, the initial, at the initial level there was uh, like a big uh, transition from one market to another market. But eventually when there is a, like the uh, kids moving from primary to end, uh, the, the next level of education, then eventually the, the the, uh, the return from the labor market would might uh, overturn the return from the, the from the education market in terms of human capital development. That's why what we are trying to see that in the, the medium to long term that the impact basically get uh, reduced as compared to, to to in the short run where we use the panel of this this uh, the, uh, from 2011 to 2013 and for the medium to long term we will use this panel of uh, 11 to 16 it might be possibility that the, 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 the penetration or the absorption within the, the two different market would be at the at the, the next stage where the return from the, the education maybe the as uh, I just skipped the the quality parameter while explaining the theoretical model this it is also important in terms of the the quality of human capital, whether uh, the preferences uh, based on the, the what would be the return from the the the, the child market and the, the the labor market as well as the, uh, the the education market. So these are two different things, and uh, probably we are also looking for how we can explain in terms of why, it, despite some positive impact on the in the on the the enrollment the, on the other hand there is a, like a, either insignificant or in some cases uh, there is a higher chances of a, a dropout so so what we see when we disaggregate this whole analysis in terms of gender as well as the age group so we can find that, that though there is a significant reduction in term of a, and drop out among the the boys but it eventually have on the increasing side among the girls so so this will give some idea that instead of narrow down down the the gender gap between the, uh, the among the education market the, the cash transfer basically uh, pulling this gender gap on the the other side of the dimension rather than reducing it it, it increasing the gender gap so these are the few few hypotheses on which we feel that give us some answer to these questions that Kate raised in the in the comments. Um, thank you. That's really helpful. And then there are some uh, follow up comments by uh, Mehreen Mahmood, for instance. She's asking, uh, can you comment on the control group means for these outcomes? That would be helpful to understand the treatment effects. Um, and then in terms of uh, to understand the time effects in terms of the, the short run as well as the long run, Kate is suggesting you might want to decompose the timing of the transfer versus the age of the children. Um, so you will have some kids who are older when the transfer starts and younger when the transfer starts. So if you could bring in the age dimension, that might help to understand the timing uh, better. Okay, so I'll we will see. Uh, we split the sample as earlier I said into two different age group. One is like uh, five to eleven year, and the twelve to fourteen year. It will also give some ideas that the, when the, the age group is on the the higher side, the, uh, the 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 chances to be in the the school market is getting low as compared to to shift toward the 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 labor market. So these are the two two dynamics that we feel. Uh, will incur. Then the, uh, uh, related to this, the control group and the, the treatment group, basically the, the control group is that we assume is similar to, 
to but uh, the group that is getting the benefit from BISP, like that's what we call the treatment group. In that case, the best beneficiary household are the treatment group. But the parallel to that, uh, what we assume the same group that is uh, have the similar characteristics, but they are not part of BISP. Ideally, when we have this RCT at the pilot stage, we can have the uh, almost 100% similar group. So we should have a, like a group with the same PMT score like 11 to 16.17 for treatment as well as the control group. And we do intervention on the some part and the not, uh, other would be the control group. But in that case, when the intervention is already done and the, the BISP is covering the entire country, then we use this quasi experimental approach where we can have a, like a similar group and try to see how uh, they are very close. That's what the bandwidth comes into uh, action that uh, if the bandwidth is very large, then the there is a chance that the, the, the uh, treatment group and the control group might have a different characteristic, but keep into a small, it will give you an idea of this, how we can keep them. Thank so thank the you. basically are outcome variable. In that case, we have this, uh, the, the labor market as well as the education market indicator are, are outcome variable. Should I move on the next slide? So there's one uh, comment about these results that you're showing on this slide. Um, so girls seem to be working more, but boys less as a result of the cash transfer. Uh, if we look at the gender disaggregated results. Uh, so can you comment on what might uh, have caused a massive reversal in the long run? So in the short run, we see that girls are working more compared to boys, but then that reverses in the long run. So is there something special that might have happened between 2013 to 2016? So Farah is asking this. And uh, finally, there's another comment. Were you able to find the impact of this program on any adult females joining the labor force or starting some work from home versus that that might be a reason for the higher dropout for female students? Actually, we didn't explore the impact of uh, in this study on the, the adult labor market, the focus was only on the child labor market. The other, uh, the drawback with this uh, data set was that, that the, the individual level matching, just like the the, uh, the PIDE have a data panel data set where we have an individual level matching. So where we can uh, exactly see at the age of like a kids at the age of six year or seven year, after five years where now it's heading toward either to the labor market other. But in that case, uh, if this was a possibility, probably we will be in a better position to see these dynamics, how these different. But as earlier I said, the, the theoretical, uh, the underpinning of this whole exercise that the, the preferences of the household matters a lot in terms of uh, making a decision. So the, the in terms of uh, the gender gap persists and it is widening over the in the longer time period, it will give us an idea that the 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 preferences to enroll uh, children, especially girls in the middle school is uh, very low as compared to, to enroll uh, boys in the middle school as a, if the result are shown that in the, the, uh, the enrollment is uh, have, have a positive impact of BSP on enrollment in middle class as, uh, as compared to the girls where it has no impact. So these type of things can basically explain how So there is another question like the quality of education at the basic education level determine the risk of child in labor. Yes, uh, we uh, uh, explained this point in the, our theoretical framework, but we didn't capture this with the existing data set, how we can uh, see the quality part of this education. Though it is very important because the decision to retain their kids with either to the labor market or to the education market depends on the return from two different markets. And if there is no return from the, or the low return from the education market, then probably the first choice among these, the target group, that's already a, a poor target group. So their first preference would be uh, to, to shift, uh, even if it, they are in the, in the primary stage, they are in the, school education market they shift to the the labor market and with the, the pre-education especially in Punjab 
and um, now in the uh, other provinces also uh, will allow them to 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 send their kids in the primary education but with the the, the age when they are increasing from about 10 they the, the preferences would be changed. so so to what extent this uh, in uh, basically mediating the preferences of these people this is a, a, again a question that need to be linked with the quality as well as to see how the mediating factor can play their role in terms of making a decision. So we did not do that type of analysis by looking into the channel effect as well as the role of different mediating factor. But eventually if we can incorporate those things that will help us to, to give a deeper answer to these questions. Now coming back to the, the the child labor part, so so we examine so again we use the similar setter to examine the impact of uh, base bone at the full sample as well as among the gender boys and girl and also at the different uh, different age group and we find that this cash has no significant impact on the child labor for participation in the short run. However, result from the analysis. Uh, Gender show that the base cash does not influence labor force participation among boys in the short term and girls in the treatment group are 30 percent take point more likely to participate in the labor market. The results suggested that the insignificant in the full sample is driven by the effect in the male subsample. And regarding working hour, we find that the overall children in the treatment group are more likely to engage in more are of work in the short term than in the control group. Importantly, BISP intervention is linked with the more working hour for girls than boys. That's what also we link with the, the previous finding of, on the education that the UCT increased labor force party among girls, but not boys is consistent with the finding from the previous study. We show that cash transfer may increase child labor among girls. The finding also explain why enrollment rate are higher for boys in treatment group than in the girls for the girl group and why drop of rate are higher for the girls in the treatment group than boys. So th this will give you the answer how the, the transition from two different markets will explain these answers. The dynamics are how are different in terms of medium to long whereby the consistent or theoretical prediction children in the treatment group are less likely to participate in the labor force and the work fewer. So over the longer period of time, so they, they work in the so again, the idea as a, the, I'll start the start of the presentation that the layoff time period that actually we didn't account in this whole exercise, but there is a possibility of layoff either they are not engaged in any market. So with the, the additional income, it would be possible that they might not have so these type of things. Just to flag that we have about four minutes uh, before five so and there are a couple of questions that the audience has so would you like to take questions now or is there something else give me a five minutes so if you give me a five minute i'll close the presentation then we will have a question answer okay so so with uh, so then we like the similar we conducted uh, the impact on this uh, child poverty as earlier i said so we have a uh, multi-dimensional child poverty so it shows that there is a significant impact on reducing the child poverty so so overall so the the question of this it is like a work through mainly through the the education part rather than the uh, the labor part so so in the long run though there is an impact on the uh, the labor poverty reduction so so this again linked with the, the previous finding that uh, in the long run there is a reduction in the, the participation of the, the child in the labor market, but in short run, it, it, there is no impact. So these are the findings. Then we use a multiple uh, like uh, robustness test. So as earlier I said, we also use cross-section analysis to see how our results are robust with the, the result that we presented for the panel analysis. Then we also replicate the, the entire result with the alternate bandwidth for that we use like the smaller bandwidth of three and well, as well as the optimal bandwidth. Later on, when we have this multiple uh, outcome, then there is a possibility that we, uh, there is a, 
like uh, the impact uh, there is a like misreporting of the biasness of the results so for that we need to see whether the, this multiple uh, outcome hypothesis testing will hold or not for that and we use this multiple hypothesis testing uh, uh, method to see with whether our result remain consistent with the original result and, and when we find that our result remain consistent with our and so i just to see that our result are almost similar but i already explained in the previous so now coming to the the key finding of the the, the study that the merge from this whole so uct have a positive effect on enrollment and grade promotion but no effect on the drop out in the short and further while the additional income from the cash drive induced investment in education the effect of cash transfer on enrollment wanes over the time so the uh, the longer period the, the, the impact would be and the finding of a positive relation between cash transfer and enrollment is consistent with our theoretical prediction that the cash transfer should increase expenditure for child education and thus enrollment in the school we find that in the short term the cash transfer are associated with the widening of the gender gap as earlier i said the enrollment but narrowing the medium to long term further the bis intervention reduces the dropout rate among boys in the short term but increases dropout among girls the finding ties in with the theoretical prediction which suggests that if parents are on every more altruistic toward boy than girl either the test parameter for the male children the human capital is larger than the for the female uh, child human capital than the effect of government transfer on female child human capital development will be weaker than those on the male child human capital development although often uh, attributed to the discrimination and prejudice against the female children the cultural environment in the country in danger of general preferences for son as they are considered to have a higher future earning capacity and to more viable as insurance or security for economic asset toward the future shop when parents become old so regarding child labor while cash transfer have no significant impact on child labor for participation in short run we find that the medium to long run the cash transfer reduce the likely would have participation in the labor force and the number of work uh, cash transfer are also linked with the more working hours for girls than boys in the short run in the medium to long run the child labor reduces uh, uh, among girls and their education are going to do not improve significantly indicating that the preference to reduce child labor among girls may favor engagement other than school activities so, so that's what we, there is we are lacking in term of investigation due to the data issue so i conclude my discussion by saying that so our results suggest that the uct can be an effective uh, can be as effective as cash transfer conditional on schooling however the best experience basically also suggests that the effect of uct wane over time thus over a sufficiently long period it is likely that uct can have a non linear relationship with the education and the child labor outcome so this we can say that the adoption of the potential hybrid cash transfer program that minimize the coexistence uh, extensive cost involved in the maintaining and enforcing condition, conditions associated with the ccd but put across sufficient condition intermittently to ensure that the impact of uct extend over the longer period of time for instance even in the absence of binding condition uct are linked with a very strong short term effect thus the condition can be introduced much later in the program when the effectiveness of the transfer being to be so so the rather than imposing a condition at the very early stage of the program that condition can be uh, imposed at the later stage with this i conclude my presentation thank you so much thank you so much dr nasir um that was a very interesting set of results so we have uh, some uh, members from the audience who would like to ask a question uh, manzoor ahmed i will um, i'm unmuting you and if you can please ask your question i think he's dropped out so dr moazam has a question so i will unmute him now uh hello can you hear me hamna yes yes um thank you chair uh, and uh, thank you to krip for such an interesting seminar but thank you very much uh, nasir sir for such a such a very carefully thought out model uh, 
let me just make one comment, which is, and that is really much more for future work. I know you have an intergenerational model and I know neoclassicals love these kinds of things, fair enough. I think you would do much better to have an intergender model because your results show that. What is clearly happening is that if you, if this goes back to the comment I had made earlier, which is what is kids, children's labor divided into? It is their time is divided into labor time, school time, and let's call it something else. New classicals call it leisure. But really gender brings in the point that separating out boys and girls, there is a very strong substitution effect. And therefore what is happening is that when households accept a cash transfer, they may initially move boys out of the labor market and reduce their hours of work, but this substitute for it and your coefficients were almost similar between boys and girls, but in opposite directions, that they substitute girls for boys. Therefore, what you need in your model over kids' time is the relationship across gender and kids' time between boys and girls in school, in, in work, and somewhere outside. But you need that element of sub, the substitution effect. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very interesting suggestion. Definitely, I look into these things. The substitution effect as important as in uh, one of my paper that I did on and the, when Dr. Simon was on the impact of cash transfer on the, the fuel choices, where we try to see how this substitution effect and the income effect will work and play in terms of making decision about the, the choices among the, in the, the traditional as well as the modern fuel. So I look into these, the gender dimension of this whole concept. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nasser. Um, we're out of time now. Uh, there is one more question and I I'm afraid this might have to be the last one that we take. So Mohammad Mujahid would like to ask a question. I'm unmuting you. And if you can please ask your question now. Muhammad Mujahid, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, Mujahid from Jahania. I would like to thank Dr. Nasri Kwal for their presentation. Actually, BISP doesn't share uh, their data, so it's very interesting having the work on the BISP project. Uh, it's very interesting. And I would like to love to hear more presentation from Dr. Nasik Balsa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think we will now end. We're at 5.06. Um, and I understand a lot of you may have to now uh, go to other commitments. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser, for this very interesting set of results. Thank you so much.